It's the home of rampant piracy and copycat business models, and bound by an education system that rewards rote learning over creativity. Yet in some industries, China has proven that yes, it can innovate. And that model for success is needed now more than ever. With its economy slowing down, China must find new ways to boost production and achieve sustainable growth. Innovation is the key, but can China do it? The Chinese government has made it a priority with plans to reshape the economy to rely more on entrepreneurship. But can there be a top-down blueprint for innovation? And can more imaginative ways of doing business seep into China's more traditional sectors? This month, we're in the heart of Beijing's tech hub to find out if innovation can transform the nation with Kai-Fu Li, the influential tech commentator and investor, Andrew Ng, chief scientist at the Chinese search giant Baidu, and Sol Hitai, CEO of the Chinese online lender Dianrong.com. All at the table this month on China. Andrew Ng, Kai-Fu Li, and Sol Hittite, welcome to On China from long location at People Square, a popular co-working space for startups here in Beijing. Now, there's this thinking out in the West that there's not much innovation in China. Is that point of view completely outdated? It's, it's very outdated. I think China has moved forward very quickly in the areas of mobile, social, and wherever there is an opportunity to build products and make money, I think China has come up with innovations. In terms of basic innovations and breakthrough, certainly still lacks the Silicon Valley. I think one of the things that's contributed to the false stereotype of a lack of innovation in China is that if you live in the U.S. and if there are you know two similar products, one in the U.S., one in the China, and you happen to see the U.S. one first just because you live in the U.S., then when you learn about the China one, you're like think, oh, that's the Chinese version of my U.S. product. Mm -hmm. And quite often, the Chinese version was invented first. Actually, one recent example, I think uh, Momo was invented well before Tinder. It predates Tinder. But today, people say Momo is the Chinese version of Tinder. Maybe yeah. Tinder is actually the American version mm -hmm. of Momo. Yeah. And, and if you look at the, you know, the large tech companies in China, um, Ali really thinks about commerce in a different way than American companies. Baidu thinks about search in a different way than American companies. Tencent has innovated in social in ways that I don't think see any U.S. company having done. This is not to say everything's invented in China, it's just that both the U.S. and China are inventing a ton of stuff and bo both really should learn from the other. So people that are innovating in Silicon Valley have a very established system. Things are mature, the roads work, the processes are working. But if you take something like our domain, internet finance, there is no credit bureau. So how do we evaluate a person and give him a loan? Uh, there is no culture of investing. So how do we explain to a person that, yes, you need to diversify, you need to do, you need to do, you need to do. So these are the problems that I think are parts of building infrastructure. So perhaps what is happening today in China is going super fast compared to what happened in the U.S. after the 60s and the 70s. That's what fascinates me here in China. Now, there are many drivers for innovation uh, around the world. I mean, you've got to have talent, access to capital, also government policy. But what is the secret ingredient for successful entrepreneurs and innovators in China? What's the key? It's hunger. Yeah, I think, I think more than, obviously there's passion, there's desire to make a difference, there's wealth, but I think there's hunger. I think the Chinese entrepreneurs are the, often the first generation in their family history who can make it. There's high expectations on them. Um, they've studied well, they work hard, and they really desire to become that first person in their family uh, to really make you know, $100 million or to build a great product. That hunger is so much more than, say, in Silicon Valley. When, when I take our entrepreneurs from Beijing to visit Silicon Valley, they're very impressed by how smart and creative people they are, but they secretly go back and ask me, Kai-Fu, you know, why don't they work as hard as us? I'd like to ask about the role of the government in innovation in China. Um, does the government here play a helpful role? Does it meddle too much? Your thoughts? I, I think the government is now putting all the wood behind the single arrow of innovation and it's putting all kinds of policies forward, policies that, that help create spaces like this one, uh, policies that help early stage investors who can have downside protection, uh, incentives that help returnees, um, and telling all the industries they need to be internet plus. So I think it's a very enlightened 
very aggressive, very determined, and uh, fairly strong in ability to execute in terms of turning into reality. Lots of dollars are going into this, I think more so than any other country that I know. A question about access to capital and the general economic environment, because we all know, the world knows that China is going through a slowing economy right now. Does that concern you about the pace of innovation in China? I, I think China has multiple sources of capital in it. So, it, so the Chinese entrepreneur has almost everything the American entrepreneur has. All the top VCs, American VCs are here, Chinese VCs with US dollar denomination, targeting foreign IPO or acquisition. But also now there's a capability of local currency. Our local companies uh, that have gone public, done very well, are using its uh, money that it's raised to fund more companies. Local billionaires are funding it. In some sense, the last uh, year has been too exuberant and maybe too rich. I think now a down-to-earth valuation, we, we welcome that. Mm -hmm. You're saying there was a bubble? Um, it was over, there was over overvaluation. Yeah, yeah. Bubble in certain companies, but probably there's not a bubble in the overall economy. Mm -hmm. The Chinese mobile users have gone from, you know, 1 million to 700 million in the last six years. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more room to grow. Mm -hmm. If you are a VC, if you have, a, if you have a, a strategy to do global investment, it's impossible for you to ignore China. What are you going to find a market with 1.3, 1.4 billion people that uh, 1 billion soon, in a few years, is going to be living in cities. That's a market that does not exist. It never existed in, in the history of humankind. So any VC that ignores China is going to ignore a big opportunity. Right. Um, that additional driver to success, talent, and being able to keep top talent in China and to attract top talent from overseas, and the quality of life issues in China you know, pollution, housing, traffic. Is, is China able to address these issues to make sure that top talent stays in the country? Yeah, let me tell you one thing that excites me, which is when I look at the uh, tech talent in China, it's amazingly young. And when I look at the average age of the Chinese employees in tech um, and the things they're able to do despite them being so young, I think 10 years from now, oh my goodness, this is going to be such a powerful force as they keep learning, as management structures get even better, as the skill set improves. Imagine what tech in China will be. But you know, one, one thing about this whole innovation question, uh, sometimes it's posed as a competition, my country versus your country or whatever. And it really isn't. I think innovation uplifts the whole world. We all learn from each other. So you're seeing a whole crop of serial entrepreneurs. Is there an Elon Musk of China? Does it frustrate you when the comparisons are made between Baidu and Google in the press or, or people out there who are curious about what you're doing? I think there are natural comparisons. Yeah. Um, unless you're aware of you know, what really happens in both China and in the US, maybe it's hard to appreciate how extremely different they are. Uh, Google has done a very good job building up you know, an Android ecosystem. Uh, Baidu is very focused on connecting people to services, not just information. So. Um, Today, if you do a web search for a, for a movie ticket, uh, by doing things, our job doesn't end at sending you off to some web page. We want to help you find what you're looking for, help you find, complete the transaction, maybe select the seat you want in the theater so you can go around the corner and pop in the movie theater, maybe already having paid for the ticket and just walk in and enjoy the show. Now I'm going to focus on Seoul. Um, so, Seoul, you are the founder and CEO of Dianrong.com, which is a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform in China. Um, you're, you're brokering relationships between borrowers and lenders, offering rates very, very competitive compared to banks. Um, previously, you were at Oracle. What brought you to China to become an entrepreneur here? Right. It's the same things that I was talking about before. The, the fact that there is a market here that uh, if you succeed in your innovation, the impact that you're going to have is much bigger considering the number of people. In the U.S., when we were building Lending Club, all the other services are there. The credit bureau is there, the payment service is there, uh, pretty much everything is well done and regulated. But in China, evaluating a person that does not have a house based on his three years history of employment, somebody who works for Microsoft versus somebody who works for Huawei is different than somebody who works for a restaurant. So we have to come up with these things and we have to build a new infrastructure to support our a philosophy on who do we pick to give a loan to. 
At the same time, we have to build the lender side by explaining to people why is it safe to do investments in this way and not just put everything in one place. So thank you for that. Um, Kaifu, what companies, what industries are capturing your attention these days? At this point, you know, we see that uh, shared economy still hasn't played itself out. Uh, China has a very unique uh, environment where there are a lot, there are over 20 cities with over uh, 2 million people. And people outside China don't realize that. It's not just one market. It's many, many, many markets many of markets. millions of people each. Yeah. Any one of these urban areas could be a gold mine. Yeah. I see in the U.S., you know, Uber started in New York or San Francisco, and, and those are perhaps the largest cities most suitable for them. But in China, you can do much more. Um, imagine someone who's trying to do, let's say, household cleaning in Kansas, right? So you're gonna, that person is going to end up doing more time driving than cleaning because the spaces could be very large if, if it's rural Kansas. But in, Beij in, in Beijing or any one of the top 20 cities, uh, the person could be very busy just working within one neighborhood. The dense population is turned into a benefit. And also now payment is very easy. So this is where we see specific areas of shared economy O to O can be very exciting. But we're also trying to avoid areas where people are throwing billions of dollars and that's too late to enter. What are those no-go areas? Well, any area where uh, multiple major competitors are throwing huge amounts of money. Online gaming. Uh, uh, I, I'm thinking more ride sharing, mm -hmm. Uber versus DD. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Online gaming, I think there's still opportunities. That's actually an area uh, we're looking at. Not online gaming per se, but online entertainment. Mm -hmm. Another area is um, hardware, Internet of Things, robotics, uh, because China is the world's manufacturing country. Most of the world's um, pro hardware products and consumer are made, appliances. Consumer appliances, yeah. China lagged back then because China's software engineering skills weren't as good as American. Now that's as good, yeah. but now the good, equally good software engineers are now connected to the locally capable hardware manufacturing skills. So I think the, I would I would um, make a bold prediction that a lot of uh, great uh, hardware innovations. Um, connected devices, smart chips, and uh, smart Internet of Things will come out of, out of China. And who is creating these investment opportunities for you? What is the quality of, of China's entrepreneurs today? The, the qualities are a hundred times better than six years ago. Yeah. And I, I, I don't mean that with any intent of exaggeration. Mm -hmm. the, the, the whole crop of this um, uh, serial entrepreneurs is truly emerging in China. So you're seeing a whole crop of serial entrepreneurs. Is there an Elon Musk of China? I, I don't think so. Um, and, that, and, and this is because the Chinese innovation isn't a wow, think, you know, do the impossible. Yeah. It's more of let's build something people want and iterate. Mm. And eventually the thing becomes innovative. It's like Tencent's WeChat. If, you, if we showed it to someone who's never seen it before, they'll say, wow, that's innovative. But it wasn't built in a Steve Jobs, Elon Musk style. They had a great dream and they want to change the world. It's built as one very targeted product that solves a problem, then they iterate. So it's more the Facebook style. So I think if you ask me, are there Mark Zuckerbergers of China? I think there will be many. Hmm. One day there'll be an Elon Musk in China? Uh, one day. One when day. the education system becomes more, um, more um, uh, good for creative, individual mm. curiosity, encouraging thinking. I think the Chinese schools don't currently encourage asking mm. why, and definitely don't encourage asking why not. Mm. And if you can't ask why not, you can't be an Elon Musk. Mm. So you know, actually, Kaifu, just now you said something that, that uh, I really agree with, which is the rise of O2O in China. So as you can ask you, how yeah. would you explain O2O to someone that doesn't live in China? Uh, well, imagine uh, your phone now has a bunch of apps that can pretty much give you, we used to think about e-commerce as using a, uh, a mobile device or a PC to buy something can be shipped to your home. But now imagine all the things that can't be shipped but can also be made available. Right? If you feel like eating, um, uh, eating a, a, a little lobster or a little Chinese pancake, or if you want a massage, if you want your house cleaned, um, if you want to look for someone to look after your kids. In China, basically, they're all available at, at, at the fingertip. And lo a lot of this is made possible by um, a great venture capitalist system that funds these companies, that try these things out, and the ones that work stay. 
and and also I think people are willing to try new things so it's all the perfect environment also the cities are densely populated so that there is a trainer probably who is uh, pretty close to you mm -hmm. as well as a babysitter it may ask I mean there's something called China speed all right just the pace of business in China is frenzied and it's fast and Kai Fu, a personal question, if I may, because you recently you've you've written a book yeah. um, about what you've experienced, um, your battle with cancer, and you talked about you know just the meaning of slowing down and savoring life. How is that message getting across to, to people and, and entrepreneurs in China? Well, I. I think the, what makes all this going with the hunger and the drive and the dedication is exactly um, against the message I try to <laughs> preach in my book. Yeah. So my book is probably targeting an old, older, older audience. Uh, so I, the feedback I get from people over 40 is very positive. Uh, many are rethinking about what they've already done and the tax, they were, how much they've taxed their body and maybe they should change. But I think the young people are uh, largely ignoring it. Uh, but I hope at least the message gets through is work as hard as you want, but don't kill your body. Don't do silly things and um, spend at least a little bit of time with your family. Do you think that message is getting through? I mean, because China is, is a country and fast forward. Are, are they hearing the message? Um, I think the, the people over 40 are hearing it. People under 40, hopefully a little bit of it. Okay. I'm 39. I have to say I'm going fast forward still. <laughs> <laughs> I was in, when I was your age. <laughs> Sometimes when you're behind, uh, innovation can leap you forward, maybe even uh, make, make you farther ahead than the rest of the world. So many products like this share office is already happening in different cities around the world and you know incubators and already happening and so we came back and we decided to say you know what do we want to do do we want to be an incubator which is to invest in these startups and we say no we're developers we really just want to provide office space but obviously today's uh, companies have a very different need for the office space smaller companies like them they want to have a community they want to come in know the other companies you know, they employ from three people to 30 people. Uh, and so they want to really have some, somebody who's on the same boat, so they can talk to, they can share ideas. If you think about China, it currently has two sides, right? One is on the traditional economy is we're at the slower pace of growth, and companies are very focused on cutting costs. This actually fits very well for companies that cut costs because they don't need to rent a space, renovate it for five years. Instead, they can just rent it for a week, a month, uh, a year. And so on, on that is good. And, and also another side of China is the growth that comes from the small startups. And this also fits very well for the small startups. So I see this is really the, the product for for you know, economic, relatively economic slower growth pace and with a lot of the startups. The world knows that the economy in China is slowing down. So how necessary, how imperative is it for innovation to really take root to help revive the economy? Well, the Chinese traditional economy is slowing down and um, I think the hope of the Chinese government and many of us is that the technology innovation focus will take it out by reinventing. Uh, like Sol said earlier, I think uh, there's a good reasons to be hopeful because so, sometimes when you're behind, uh, innovation can leap you forward, maybe even uh, make, make you farther ahead than the rest of the world because you're competing with a much lower level uh, capability. But um, it's, I think the jury is out. I think we're hopeful that it will work. Um, I think a lot of it depends on the stability of the secondary market. It depends on um, whether the, the how how much the slowdown will be. Uh, we're optimistic. 
uh, and I think as early stage investors, we can always find good entrepreneurs regardless the of the external environment. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of innovation in the industry that you're working in, in IT, in e-commerce, in um, high-tech hardware, et cetera, not necessarily in um, Chinese civil aviation manufacturing or in pharmaceuticals. So can innovation penetrate those more traditional industries or do you have advice to offer to those more traditional industries? You know, one thing I'm seeing is that a lot of the traditional industries in China have a, have a hunger yeah. to you know, find ways to use technology. Um, and the willingness to try new things is very high. And I think this creates an opportunity, both for those industries as well as for the technologists, to try to transform those industries. And just as uh, in China, the mobile phone, you know, is leapfrogging landlines, I think that in those industries, the starting off with a lower base, there's again a huge opportunity to, to, to leapfrog structures that maybe have been set up in other countries. You know, what will it take for innovation to really kick in and transform the Chinese economy? My final question for all three of you. We've been talking about innovation as an engine for um, China's future growth. I think that's actually one other one where China has a huge opportunity, which is education. Um, I think that the Chinese education system has been rapidly getting better, but it's not yet where it needs to be. And ultimately, education funds innovation. Education funds a lot of the economy, not just innovation. And I think that um, uh, there's a lot of room for opportunity for growth still, and a lot of the investments that China are making ought to improve it. I yeah. find that very encouraging. How do you teach innovation? You know, innovation is a, is a strategic skill. The only way to learn it is um, to see tons of examples. And, one, and I think China um, is learning like crazy. Mm. Well, I like to see more people who um, innovate in areas they love, uh, and not just for wealth. So I think that is happening. I think it will get better. And as Andrew said, I like to see the education system provide for people who are outliers and who have uh, crazy ideas, who challenge um, teachers and who ask why not. I hope that when these people are more tolerated and even encouraged, I think we'll see even more innovation. In, in addition to the education and uh, the preparation of the innovators, I think we should create a system of uh, incentive and values that uh, puts these innovators uh, as uh, people that help society. So others can take them as a model and build more of uh, those stories. So uh, in, in different countries, we have, uh, uh, we idealize different type of people like, like, like movie stars, like uh, 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 people that are good in sports and things like that. I think putting the emphasis on these innovators are gonna create a large pool of people that wanna be like them and that could drive innovation even further. All right, great conversation on innovation in China. Andrew Ng, Kai-Fu Lee, and Sol Hitte, thank you so much for joining me.